there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Con men, the most devious of all criminals. Charming, cool and calculating, they betray trust and devastate lives, yet remain a complete enigma. We are about to explore the mysterious world of these master criminals, giving an unprecedented insight into the workings of the complex minds of some of the world's most cunning con men and women. We will reveal the detail and the intricacies of their elaborate crimes and uncover how they were dramatically brought to justice. In this show, we uncover the incredible story behind one of Britain's most prolific and compulsive confidence tricksters, who hid behind the bogus persona of an exceptional yet eccentric Cambridge University professor to habitually and compulsively try to dupe legions of victims out of millions of pounds. If I had to sum up Robert Hyams, I would describe him as a parasitic con man. Robert Himes posed as a university professor, groundbreaking scientist and even a terrorist to make money and cover his web of lies. His style worked extremely well. He told me he was a professor. The sort of bumbling professor who's very clever but a bit, a bit distracted and he uses the people's reaction to that in order to manipulate them and deceive them. He had got a plausible explanation for every challenge that you put to him. A con man so prolific that while on bail, he even went on to con another 81 people out of their hard-earned cash. He's a very, very convincing liar, as most con men are. He was a weasley little man. He is a classic con man. Robert Hyams was born on the 13th of May, 1954 and is a well-educated man with a genuine master's degree in philosophy and science from Warwick University. Up until 1987, Hyams worked legitimately as a microbiologist with his scientist wife. After going bankrupt in 1990, his prolific criminal career as a con man began. In 1991, Hyams bizarrely hit the headlines. He set up a laboratory in a converted farm building in Essex and went to the press, claiming that working with a Russian research team, he had made a breakthrough in AIDS research and was close to discovering a cure, as these images from the time show him boasting. Hyams' claims were unfounded, but this persona of a groundbreaking scientist became Hyams' manipulative weapon, used to disarm his victims in order to obtain goods that he had no intention of ever paying for. The fact that Hyams uses this persona of, of the university professor who's a research scientist developing a cure for AIDS and all the other stories that he came up with, this sort of eminent scientist, um, creates not only a, a feeling in people's minds that he's an authority figure, he's very clever, um, you know, he's somebody to be respected and, you know, common do use that sort of character quite often. We all have prejudices and if we are looking to be ripped off then we usually expect that person to, well maybe not come with a bag that says swag on it and a stripy t-shirt but we expect there to be something a little bit iffy about that person. Hyam presented himself as an upper class gentleman, a bit of a bumbling professor. And I think that that persona was quite disarming and that persona was something that helped him get away with so much over so many years. A year later, the bogus professor was sentenced to four years imprisonment after he ambitiously conned £236,000 from the farming community. Hyams had been obtaining £20,000 to £30,000 loans from different finance companies. He was claiming that the money was to buy farming equipment that either did not exist or he did not own. Hyams faced 19 charges of deception in total, which also involved other scams. Hyams sold farm equipment he didn't own, pocketing the bogus profit, and also purchased goods with bad checks, a staple theme of his con man career. He gives the impression that he's from money and money's no object to him, um, and it works very well when he's dealing with these people. 
um, on numerous occasions he would go into normal shops and actually arrange for the delivery of items. Now, well-off people often do that. I know they will go into a shop and say, can you have this delivered to my house? I'll pay you, you know, can I create an account with yourselves? He'll create an account and uh, he'll obtain thousands of pounds worth of goods with never the intention to pay for it. Uh, and then these people, after a few months, he'll speak to them on the phone. Uh, they'll come to his door, he'll speak to them and he'll make excuses why the payment's not been made. He'll write them cheques, uh, which subsequently bounce, uh, or he'll tell them the money transfer has just been made from his bank to account to theirs. And he can, he can string them on for months, till eventually they realise that he's conned them. I think that the kind of lifestyle that he was maintaining would have been enough to give most people a nervous breakdown, and yet this was just the norm to him. So that suggests to me that maybe even there was something in his biochemistry that actually he couldn't get the same level of anxiety. He couldn't have that same level of, of arousal that the rest of us would get. Bogus scientist Robert Himes appealed against his conviction for his £236,000 con and had his sentence reduced to just a year. Unlike most con artists who live a solitary life, Himes had a partner and four children. Despite his custodial sentence, Himes' family stood by him during his prison term and the police believe his partner and four children had very little or no knowledge of his consistent conning. But Hyams' conning was the key to providing for his family, conning small, in some cases seemingly insignificant amounts of money, in order to give his family the best things in life. He leased houses and never paid the rent, hired top-of-the-range cars racking up bills of £8,000 he had no intention of paying, and duped private schools into educating his children without paying the £5,000 tuition fees and his family, it seems, were none the wiser. He has a wife and a family, and yet he's been able to move them around every six months or so, renting houses and uh, using unusual checks and methods of payments or disputes, and yet he's still been, been able to maintain that sort of family life, um, which is incredibly difficult, and um, it says a lot about his personality and the hold he has over his family, that he was able to do that successfully without them actually realising quite how he was getting his money. Even family holidays were the fruits of Hyam's criminal career, a fact guest house owner Roberta Truin learned firsthand when Hyam's and his family booked in for a two-week stay. We we had a cash payment of £300 and they then owed £700. And while Hyams stayed at the guest house, he was keen to ingratiate himself with Roberta. He would come into my son lounge for oh, seven, eight times or more a week about different trivialities. There was something about him I didn't like. He was a in my opinion, a weasley little man. And as the two-week stay came to an end, Hyams settled the bill like any other customer, only it was all lies and part of his usual practice. Hyams had no intention of paying, but it didn't stop him going through the motions and having the audacity to write the cheque out in front of Roberta. He wrote it out here and uh, he said, there we go, that's a £700 cheque. Is that correct? I said, that's correct. That's the last I saw of them. It may have been the last Roberta ever saw of Robert Hyams, but not the last she saw of his worthless cheque. As soon as he left the guest house, the con man cancelled the £700 cheque, and Roberta was shocked when the bank sent the worthless piece of paper back. Couldn't believe it. I thought, gosh. I went straight to the police. They took away the cheque. Although the complaint was logged by the police, Roberta never saw Hyams again or had her money refunded. I didn't ever think maybe he wouldn't pay me. I thought he would. Um, imagine how you can be conned by, by people. In the twisted world of confidence tricksters, £700 may not seem like a great deal of money, but this was the key to Hyams' success. He committed individual, small-scale cons on a monumental and almost obsessive scale. Individually, each incident seemed like a civil, not criminal case. But Hyams was rapacious. Where he lived, what he drove and what goods he obtained were hoodwinked from unsuspecting victims, leaving trustworthy people like Roberta feeling violated and out of pocket. It has made me question people who are paying me a cheque. But people are not all like Hyams. They're not evil. 
They're not deceitful. It really is despicable. It's evil. Coming up, Haim's criminal ambition grows and he plans to dupe the art world out of over one million pounds. He nearly pulled off what would have been actually a massive heist. Robert Hines is very different from the sort of Jack the Lad type conman that people associate with scams. Robert Hyams is a calculating career con man who prolifically conned people out of goods and money by posing as a bumbling yet bogusly eccentric university professor. He creates his own references, his own false documents. He would look you straight in the eye and say, I don't understand the problem. Took his family around Britain living in million pound mansions, all on the basis of forged documents and false claims. There must be some communication situation between you here and there. There was something I honestly didn't like about him. That's just his way of life. He's going to live off other people. Hyam's prolific conman career focused on duping service industries on a vast scale, renting houses and cars for six month periods and moving on without paying. The police believe Hyam's family were ignorant to his relentless conning, but in 1998, 44-year-old Robert Hyams' lies to his family proved to be his undoing. Hyams' family believed their academic father and husband had received a position at a leading university in California, and they were moving lock, stock and barrel to the USA. It was all lies. The job was fictional, and so when the day came when the Hyams family were due to set off on their new life, Robert Hyams audaciously took a drastic action to make sure they could not travel. He created a terrorist alert at Heathrow Airport. We see actually a little crack in uh, Hyams' um, schemes. Having told his family that they're actually going to move Lock, Stock and Barrel over to California, they're actually not. He never had any plans for them to do so, but ultimately things were going wrong. So he st decided that uh, he would ring up Heathrow Airport on four occasions, say he was from the IRA and they had to clear the airport. Now for a man who's very practised at lying, he couldn't just make up a simple lie. He actually went to the extreme of phoning up the airport and saying there'd be mass death and destruction because there was a bomb in the airport. Himes had phoned Heathrow Airport adopting an Irish accent and left chilling messages and death threats. Himes made four calls over two hours, contacting the BBC, the Civil Aviation Authority and Heathrow Airport, claiming that there would be widespread death and destruction should the airport not be evacuated. I mean, I guess he did, he thought, well, I'm trapped. The only thing I could think of is, is this desperate measure. Um, and most of us wouldn't do that because it's just too outrageous. But if, if you're a, a sociopath or, you know, with, with limited <laughs> conscience, basically that kind of thing doesn't bother you. You don't think about consequences or anything like that. Talk about just taking things a step too far. This is a man who routinely lied and you have to wonder what went wrong on this on this particular occasion. I think that he must have had a lapse in imagination that he couldn't think of anything convincing to say to his wife, but what lengths to go to? Thankfully, of course, the, the police actually trace those phone calls as they do on those sorts of um, scenarios. And he was in fact arrested and sentenced for that crime. During the trial, a voice expert concluded the twisted hoax calls were made by Hyams and the telephone company traced the calls to Hyams' address. It also transpired that Hyams had tampered with his phone line during the week after his hoax calls to make it seem someone else had made the calls. Hyams pleaded not guilty, but on the 1st of July 1998, he was sentenced to two years in prison for the bogus calls. As well as losing his liberty, this period also saw him lose his common law wife as his relationship ended after his bizarre and dangerous stunt. Supposedly his wife didn't know, she actually thought he was a professor, um, which you know, is testament both to how convincing people can be and that how willing people are to be convinced. In 1999, after being released from prison early, Hyam simply continued conning, but this time upped his game and ensured he had the tools to make his fictional conman persona of a biotechnics professor working on cures for cancer and AIDS completely convincing he bought a fake certificate online. At some point, people are going to confront Hyam, aren't they? They're going to want some sort of proof of what he is. Now, I, actually, he found that he could buy something that, that seemed to provide a certain level of proof. He bought a certificate for £200 off the internet, 
which appeared to uh, claim that he was a professor of a university that actually didn't exist. So it shows a bit of an arrogance to me, but obviously that was useful to him. People believed him. Himes started a new relationship. Once again, Himes' new partner had no idea he was a compulsive con man. Robert Hyams' criminal career focused on conning relatively small amounts from copious victims that left his scams undetected by the police. Each individual and isolated case appeared to be a civil, not criminal matter, but Hyams was prolifically conning a whole host of businesses simultaneously, including car rental companies and property letting agents out of thousands of pounds. He would drive about in brand new Mercedes, 4x4s. He would actually not pay for anything. I've never known him actually pay for anything. He wouldn't pay his council tax, he wouldn't pay his BT bills, he wouldn't pay for electricity or gas. Because he was only at these locations six months at a time, he would then move on and never pay any of the utility bills. But he would still maintain, he would still use his same name. So often he would then use his wife perhaps to um, create new accounts with BT without her knowledge, to be fair to her. Um, she wasn't aware any of this was going on. But in February 2002, four years after his Heathrow bomb hoax, Hyam set about executing a multi-million pound con targeting the art world. Hyam sort of changes tack slightly and he decides that he's going to defraud Christie's, the auction house. And he does that by getting a forged document from the Bank of California which purports to say that he is able to spend up to five million pounds. I mean, a huge amount of money, which most people think nobody would have the audacity to go in with and say and forge a five million pound credit note. But basically, that's what he did. Well, I think that the Christie's incident was really his downfall because up until then, his scams had been frequent, you know, but fairly small, really, in the grand scheme of things. The Christie's scam was not dissimilar to Robert Hyams' traditional cons. Hyams adopted his usual persona of the well-to-do, bumbling professor who was also a wealthy art collector. But this con, rather than scamming six months' free rent, was ambitiously attempting to con Christie's out of six paintings with over a million pounds. The first phase of the con was to use the fake professorship and the forged American bank reference to convince Christie's he was legitimate. It looked like the bogus scientist was in reach of conning the world's most respected and auspicious auction house. But rather than attending the auctions himself, Hyams bizarrely sent his eldest daughter Catherine into Christie's to bid on his behalf. Believing her father to be a successful, renowned and wealthy scientist, she happily sat in the auction room on the phone to Hyams and enjoyed the thrill and excitement of the bidding fray. He nearly pulled off what would have been actually a massive heist. But I think the fact that he was batting outside of his league was actually what gave him away because of course he'd involved his daughter in the con. She wasn't aware of what was going on. What he did was to get his daughter, Catherine, to unwittingly go to Christie's on his behalf and, using a telephone bid system, make bids for six paintings, which added up to a huge amount of money. Catherine, blissfully ignorant of the criminal plot she was unwittingly embroiled in, sat and bid on the paintings. On the phone to her father, who was instructing her, she first secured a painting worth over half a million pounds. And further victories were to follow, Catherine subsequently won five more masterpieces for her art-loving father. As far as she was concerned, Catherine had successfully secured the six paintings her eccentric academic father desired, even if it had cost him £1,188,000 of his fortune. Catherine had no idea his fortune was fictional, and this was just the second phase of his master plan. The final stage was simply to get Christie's to ship the paintings before he transferred the funds. A trick Hyams was a master at, but his innocent daughter was not. Catherine turned out to be Hyams' Achilles' heel, and his manipulation of her was a huge mistake. And when she started to mention to Christie's that she was going to put one of these incredibly expensive pieces of work in a frame from a high street shop, that was obviously a bit of a clue that they didn't have the means they professed to have. Now, clearly that would raise enormous loud bells in the staff of Christie's mind and they realised what was going on. And as a result of that, you know, the scam just didn't work. She had broken a cardinal rule of, of 
of scamming, because of course she wasn't a con artist, um, which is that she'd effectively broken character. She wasn't keeping up appearances. Um, and I'm sure that he would have, if he'd been doing it himself, he would have known better because the basic rule is, is you don't let your guard down like that. You do find, by and large, that career con men tend to be solitary. They're always described as loners. And that's because you need to cover all bases. You know, if you've got people in your life, then they're people who could potentially give you away unless they are absolutely 100% on board with you. That was a mistake that Hyam made. His daughter didn't know what was going on, and therefore, of course, she couldn't be relied upon. Conning on such a large scale proved to be out of Hyam's league. Not only had Robert Hyam's daughter unwittingly exposed him as a fraud, but Christie's, unlike so many other businesses he had duped, were unprepared to hand over the goods without payment up front, no matter how much the bumbling professor insisted the paintings be shipped to him. With no payment from Hyams, Christie's were left out of pocket because the paintings eventually sold for £150,000 less than Hyams bogusly bid, and they needed to maintain their relationship with the vendor. Christie's called the police. Hyams' con had failed and he knew it was only a matter of time until the police found him because bizarrely when executing the Christie's con, as with all his other scams, Robert Hyams had used his real name. Certainly most con men will use different identities in order to carry out their frauds um, and he doesn't. Uh, it's almost, say, an arrogance that he doesn't care almost that he's going to be found out. I think it is unusual for a con artist not to use an alias because most of them are pretty fluid with their names and I think that's very characteristic um, about the sort of state of their identity, if you like. Um, um, they're cavalier with their identities, they're often cavalier with their names. To evade the police, the bogus professor fled the country. Hyams, with his family in tow, travelled over to the USA on the pretense that he had been employed to work on groundbreaking cancer research, leaving his innocent teenage daughter behind to face the music. Unlike the Heathrow scam in 1998, they actually went, and while in California, the family lived in luxury, initially renting a mansion worth £1.7 million that Hyams had no intention of paying for. Not content with conning people left, right and centre in this country, of course Hyams lock, stock and barrow picked his whole family up and went to live in California where he went about doing exactly the same things, buying stuff on the Never Never um, and putting out false uh, cheques and false credit notes and basically conning the Americans the way he'd conned us. The British police travelled to the USA in pursuit of Hyams for the failed Christie's con. The Metropolitan Police actually went out there and interviewed him in America for the offences, but obviously their jurisdiction there is, is, is non-existent. They have no powers of arrest. The offence for which they were investigating him wasn't sufficient enough to effect an extradition order. So they, they were forced to return to the UK and await for him to perhaps at some point return to the UK where he would be arrested for the offences. So safe from British law, Hyams was sitting pretty in the Californian sunshine, conning an opulent lifestyle he had no intention of ever paying for. But this wasn't going unnoticed. He hadn't been arrested out there, but he was being investigated because he was doing the same thing. He was renting accommodations, really good quality accommodations, the sort you would see in, in California, uh, and he never paid for anything. After living in the USA for over a year, Hyam's successful run of conning free accommodation and cars was coming to an end. The authorities were circling. He came back to the house and said, we're, we're getting the next flight out. Uh, and they did, and they left all their possessions behind. And he told her that he would have someone arrange to have the possession sent on. That was about the same time that I understand that uh, a decision had been made that he was going to be arrested for offences over there. He subsequently got, came back to England, so he was never actually dealt with for offences in America. Coming up, Hyams audaciously returns to the UK and his callous desire to con ravages even more lives. He would turn around and say, there must be a lack of communication. I cannot understand. I'm waiting for the money to come from my offshore account. Robert Hyams is a professional con man, he's a career con man. Robert Hyams is a con artist who has duped people out of tens of thousands of pounds of goods and money. But it's amazing what you can get away with if people believe that you are an authority figure. He will use this mad professor routine and he's fearless. 
He was so successful at it that he even fooled his own wife. He's brought up his family and they've lived successfully on money that's been stolen for years and years and years. He was full of pretense the whole time, no end to his folly. And he is a very, very convincing liar. After going on the run to the USA for his failed 2002 Christie's Con, Robert Himes continued conning on the other side of the Atlantic. Himes left the USA in 2003 to avoid arrest, but it was a case of jumping from the frying pan into the fire. He returned to the UK in December and attempted to buy a £2 million house in the Cambridge area. Naturally, Himes didn't have the money and the police became involved. They caught up with the con man and Himes was finally arrested in January 2004 and charged with the Christie's con. In most con man case files, bar the trial, this would be the end of the story, but released on bail in April 2004, his one-man conning mission became more rapacious than ever. And what shows the difficulty with investigating con men is that when Himes was actually arrested, he went on, whilst he was on bail, to commit another 81 offences. And that shows you the difficulty that detectives have when they arrest someone for a complicated fraud. It takes a long time to investigate, to compile the evidence and to bring a case before the court. You can't keep someone in custody for an offence like that. So they're out there still you know, conning people in order to get money to live. One of the cons Himes executed while on bail for his Christie's con was to audaciously enrol his two youngest daughters into a private school. But in his usual style, he had no intention of paying the £17,000 for the school fees. When the schools were getting a bit all right, as he'd never paid any school fees, numbering thousands, thousands and thousands of pounds, he would start to write to them saying, I'm not happy with the service you're providing, uh, I'd like you to readdress this, and once that's been addressed, perhaps I'll consider paying the fees. But he was never happy, and eventually it would culminate in him actually withdrawing his kids from the school without any payment and placing them at another school. So in its own, if that was reported to the police, the police might say, well, this is not a criminal offence in isolation. You're going to have to resolve that directly with him via solicitors. But it's only when you put them all together that you realise then that he's got a very dishonest trait with regards to his deceptions. But his cons did not always benefit his family. Awaiting trial, Robert Hyams unbelievably targeted Catherine, his student daughter from a previous relationship. Not only had Hyams already callously and cruelly implicated his innocent daughter in his doomed Christie's con, but he then went on to destroy her life by putting her £12,000 in debt. He stole his daughter's checkbook and decimated her account and overdraft. She went off to university he got hold of her checkbooks from her bank account and wrote and bounced every single check from that account. And it, it went up to about 10 or 12,000 pounds. She, as far as she was concerned, that bank account had been closed because she'd asked her father to close that bank account because she no longer needed it. And, and the next thing she heard was she started getting letters from the bank demanding in excess of 12,000 pounds. Now, most of us would not do this to somebody that we love, but I imagine that actually he didn't really think it was much of a big deal. So what? He's been in debt his whole life. It obviously doesn't phase him, so maybe just assume that it wouldn't phase her either. She was very distressed about this. As you can imagine, being a student, um, not only was she distressed about it, but the banks didn't believe her that her father had stolen the money, and they were pressing her. They. Uh, and they start pushing her with um, warrants and demands and uh, bailiffs. She, she was very distressed over that, and, and that went on for, for many, many months. Um, she doesn't speak to her father anymore, as you can imagine. And Catherine was one in a long, long list of victims. Despite the fact Hyams was released on bail, waiting for a trial date, and almost certainly facing a custodial sentence, his crimes continued. Hyams' criminal activities funded and supported his and his family's lifestyle. And shops, car rental companies, letting agents, hotel and guest houses were all duped by Hyams in the Cambridge area. He was obtaining their services but not paying. And one of Hyams' victims contacted DC John Gibbons. I first came across um, Robert Hyams um, when I picked up a, a small inquiry in relation to and a, a non-payment where he stayed in a, he'd rented a small house for a couple of weeks. It was in our local area and he hadn't paid. He'd basically just left without paying. She reported to the police. We investigated it and it really began to snowball from there from a simple little job like that. I was linking up with other officers from our own force 
uh, who are also investigating him independently for hotel stays, non-payments, um, and I picked up all the jobs together from Suffolk, thinking he was a fairly small-time criminal. Hyam's incessant conning spree was taking place while he was still awaiting trial for his 2002 Christie's con, which was being delayed because Hyams was claiming ill health. He would feign illness, um, check himself into a hospital the day before he was supposed to be at court, and clearly the judge, who, who, who wished to stay on the case from the beginning to the end, was getting quite annoyed with, his, um, with him. But ill or not, he continued to con, shockingly committing over 80 offences whilst on bail. This prolific spree included attempting to con a local shop out of £7,000 worth of goods, refusing to pay his £8,000 bill for a car rental, and duplicitously opening a bank account with false details, then spending the £12,500 overdraft. On the surface, duping relatively small amounts of money from small businesses and banks, Himes was insatiable, and his cons sustained a comfortable lifestyle and the appearance of a successful and groundbreaking professor. He would open bank accounts using false references, using his own names, and he would obtain as many checkbooks as he could. Now, most people will have one or two checkbooks running at one time. He would try and, he would say he'd lost his checkbook, so he would end up getting five or six checkbooks with 30 30 plus checks in there. And then once he think, thought he'd got sufficient amount of checks, he would then start bouncing those checks. Um, because obviously he'd got sufficient checks, the banks would at some point would realize that these accounts are thousands of pounds in deficit and they would shut the accounts down. But at that point he's got sufficient amount of checks to continue with his deceptions. Um, this is where the losers lose out, the actual uh, victims, because they accept a check from him. If the bank account is closed, they have lost. There's no doubt about that. They've lost their money. Uh, because of his persona again, the way he, he his style, the way he, he behaves, they would take big checks from him without check cards. Um, so clearly they would lose. A simple way to con people, and it's a common way of common people, and he would use that. His other way, which is quite common, but he did it very well. He would have half a dozen bank accounts running from all the major banks, um, and he would, it's called cross-firing, he would crossfire checks, large amount of checks, for half a million, three quarters of a million pounds. He would transfer one, write a check from one account for three quarters of a million pounds and deposit that into another account. That then shows up uh, on his account that of three quarters of a million. So on occasions, if he was struggling with conning people, he would go into somewhere and say, I've just printed this off. Here's my bank statement, it's got three quarters of a million pounds in it. I I've not, I'm not a problem, here's a cheque for £10,000, it's not a problem, you'll get your money. Um, soon after, obviously that three quarters of a million pound would go out as a deficit because the, the cheque would have bounced, because the cheque that he, the account he wrote it from obviously was, didn't have insufficient funds. He would contact the bank managers and keep that going for months and persuade them that there is large sums of money coming in from offshore accounts, but they would never arrive. Robert Hyam's appetite for living by fraudulent means was unquenchable. His litany of small-scale scams continued, leaving behind a long list of victims left out of pocket and feeling violated and foolish. And a number of people have said, I saw him pull up in his brand new 4 4 Mercedes. He, he appeared to have come from some money. His address was a good quality address. Um, I maybe had some reservations about giving him whatever he was after, but um, he convinced me otherwise. Uh, uh, you would hear this time after time. It's all in, you know, it's, it's in their statements. Uh, and it, and it, it did make them feel very silly and embarrassed. And there are still some who never came forward. They didn't want the police or the press to know how badly they've been conned. One of the problems with, um, with con artists and one of the reasons why it's profitable to practice it and why people do it, it's very hard to police because often we're talking about relatively small sums, often it's quite a sort of a grey area because they haven't actually broken in somewhere and robbed something. Um, obviously, you know, in the real world, you are allowed to have things on credit and, and there is a delay between when you get something when you pay for it. You can take a car back after a certain period of time, so you're not happy with it, I'm not going to pay for it. And if they don't like it, they can take you to court, but it's not actually necessarily a crime in and of itself. And um, So in that sense, He's a good example of why con artists are often able to practice as long as they do, 
um, and get away with it as much as they do because it is actually very hard to police. He would uh, approach vendors via the estate agents. He would provide false reference details that he was a professor, that he was uh, a professor at Cambridge University um, and that he'd just come back from the United States. Um, he would fabricate uh, his salaries, saying that he was earning in excess of £100,000 a year. Um, and he would, on these references, he would provide a false person who would provide these references on the anticipation they would phone him up, phone this person up to, to confirm the references. So consequently, these people phoning up Robert himself, where he would provide his own reference. And other than the initial deposit, he never did pay for the rent. And in March 2005, Hyams did exactly this to his final known victim, landlord Graham Smythe, the man who was vital in the con man's ultimate downfall. A new tenant was found by the agent, um, who then rang me to tell me that they had found a new tenant and they had managed to get more money for the rental than, in fact, um, they had done before. And Hyam's carefree attitude to money was cleverly underpinned by his appearance of wealth and the impressive trappings associated with affluence, even though he had acquired them fraudulently. When I met Mr Hyams, he seemed a genuine enough person. Um, he would want to call you by a Christian name, want you to call him by his Christian name, uh, to build up this rapport. He explained that he was a professor in biochemistry and he was smart, is smart, um, presents a very good appearance and if he can have a top of the range car etc um, people look at others and appear to judge them by what they've got round them and it succeeded where the um, agents were concerned because when questioned, the agent said he was perfectly good because he was driving a Mercedes. He had all the appearances of wealth, but nothing. Robert Himes cut an affable, friendly figure, but his professor persona was not enough to entirely convince Graham Smythe. Robert Himes um, and his family appeared to ha only have three or four uh, lounging chairs which you could purchase from a garden centre. And when I went to the house and saw this amount of furniture, uh, I said, well, what's happened to your furniture? Oh, well, we have just come in from America. And, um, you know, the furniture takes a long time to arrive. So he's been here six weeks, eight weeks, and there's no furniture? What is going on? With niggling doubts, Graham Smythe turned detective and spoke to the letting agents. So I tackle the agents and say, has the rent been paid? Um, oh, well, yes, the, the deposit's been paid. The deposit was paid in cash, which immediately starts to ring bells because you think, who's running around with loads of cash? Have you had any further payments? Um, no, but we're expecting one. Have you chased up the references? Oh, yes, yes, we chased the references. Good references um, from a bank in America, etc., etc. However, it soon turned out that Mr. Hyams had not paid his rent, had no intention of paying his rent, and although going round there and repeatedly asking him for the money, he would turn round and say, There must be a lack of communication. I cannot understand. I'm waiting for the money to come from my offshore account. He had got a plausible explanation, if he wanted to accept it, for every challenge that you put to him. But when you pressed him, how did he earn his money? Where did his income come from? He then started to backtrack and pull the, oh, I'm very ill, I don't want to um, go into this because of my heart problems, etc, etc. But Hyam's numerous excuses and attempts to sidestep Graham Smythe did not work. Graham started small claims court proceedings and went to the police, giving them the lead they needed. I decided that he was not going to get away with it. Coming up, DC John Gibbons catches up with the career con man and Hyam's con man charm means he comes perilously close to walking free. I was starting to wonder 
whether he was right and I was wrong. And at some point, I had to shake my head and think, hang on a second. Robert Hyams compulsively conned on both sides of the Atlantic, living a luxurious lifestyle and pretending to be a leading university professor. He's successful because he's got no morals, he doesn't care who he's stealing from. He has starved his family, including his own daughter. He's playing a very dangerous game for a con artist. His daughter started her college years thousands of pounds in debt. Even once he was caught and then released on bail, he went on to commit something like 81 counts of fraud and deception. He was an extraordinary con man, and certainly the best one I've come across. Hyams had been prolifically conning service industries, including estate agents, shops, and car rental businesses. Hyams was residing at a property where, in his usual style, he wasn't paying the rent. His landlord had called the police, and DC John Gibbons went and arrested the con man. And while searching the house, the shocking extent of Hyams' crimes became clear. It was obvious that they were in transit, because one of the bedrooms was full of boxes. Um, it, you would say that they, they were never intended to stay there for any great length of time because clearly they hadn't unpacked. Um, and there were stacks and stacks of mail and it was all red letter mail, all demands from solicitors, companies. Um, it, 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 there was a dozen to 20 letters arriving as we, as we were there, uh, all demands. We took all the paper from his house and we began to research everything that we'd got from there. And then I realised at that point that this was a fairly major criminal in relation to financial misconducts. Awaiting trial and on bail for his failed 2002 Christie's Con, Robert Hyams audaciously committed a further known 81 offences in the UK during 2004 and 2005, scamming an alleged total of £68,500 from his prey. But in spite of proof that Hyams was guilty, he was still not prepared to admit it when arrested on the 27th of May 2005 by DC John Gibbons. He was in complete denial. Um, we interviewed him for a couple of hours about what we knew him about. He was in denial, he was saying that um, where he'd bounced checks it was accidental. Um, he wouldn't accept any of the allegations put to him at that stage. And despite the overwhelming evidence, even when facing police questioning, Robert Himes was still a master manipulator. Even the most seasoned police personnel found themselves in danger of becoming bewitched by his twisted web of lies. Each time I interviewed him, there was at some point where I was starting to wonder whether he was right and I was wrong. And at some point, I had to shake my head and think, hang on a second, he has done this despite what he's telling me. I know he's done it because I've got all these witness statements. And as a detective trying to sort of piece together movements over several years and to, with somebody who's a consummate liar, it's very difficult and you can find yourself almost getting drawn in. It's, you know, quite understandable. His whole life is built on lies. He's just a parasite that goes from flower to flower, picking up whatever he can and then he moves on. He probably himself doesn't really know what is reality and what isn't. So he's probably quite convinced himself of some of the lies that he told. In my experience, people will deny offences and continue to deny them until the evidence is so overwhelming they will reach a point where they will say, OK, fair enough, hands up, I did do it. It took a long time before he actually conceded that he had committed offences. Uh, and then it was on the proviso, well, I must have done if you said I did. Um, but that wasn't good enough for me. Eventually he did fully admit to all the offences. DC John Gibbons' hard work had paid off. He had Hyams in custody and ended his conning rampage. The 81 offences John Gibbons painstakingly investigated were added to the Christie's case Hyams was still yet to stand trial for. And in December 2005, Himes finally faced his many charges at Southwark Crown Court. He accepted and asked for virtually all those offences to be taken into consideration, and um, which included his daughter, uh, offences against his daughter. Um, and he was convicted accordingly. He, he, the judge accepted, accepted the charges and uh, he received a, a lengthy custodial sentence. 
Hyams pleaded guilty to 10 charges and asked for a further 77 offences to be taken into consideration. These combined the charges for the Christie's Con and the crimes DC John Gibbons tirelessly investigated. Hyams was sentenced to five years imprisonment for his prolific crimes and before he was sent down, the judge said, you seem to have almost a compulsion to try and trick people out of their money. He also made note that Hyams' aim wasn't purely financial. It's interesting the judge's comments at the end of Hyams' trial because he did say he felt that Hyams was getting not only financial uh, benefit from these crimes, but also he got quite a kick out of it, and that's not unusual from common power and authority and being able to manipulate people is something that obviously gives them a great thrill. Now we're at the stage really with Hyams that his family have deserted him, you know, he's implicated his daughter in the, a con, she sort of saw him for what he was, his wife has abandoned him. Um, it'd be interesting, he's obviously at a crossroads now as to what he can do with his life. Robert Hyams started his five-year sentence on the 20th of January 2006. This is not his first custodial sentence, and those who have encountered the con man fear that this is a story without redemption. I got to know Robert quite well when interviewing him and dealing with him. He quite enjoyed the actual cons that he was doing. I'm not saying he didn't need to because he wasn't working. He needed to carry on to continue with his standard of living, his lifestyle. But he quite enjoyed it and I'm not convinced that time spent in prison will prevent him from doing it again.